Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with our next presentation. So this is a, all of these sessions have been great. This is one you're, you're definitely going to want to be here for. This is a, an incredible story. Um, take a look at the pictures up on the screen. This is, this is the area uh, where, where Anthony works. And um, I've known Anthony for a number of years, and uh, his story is quite incredible um, in a number of ways from technology and, and also um, collaboration between a number of different uh, organizations, healthcare, education, uh, broadband. And so it's, it's really quite fascinating. In fact, uh, a few months ago, Anthony gave a, a similar presentation to a group of telehealth resource centers. And um, right after we got a, an email and an invitation um, for him to share the same presentation um, and similar to what he'll share today with the FedTel group. If you're not familiar with FedTel, um, it's uh, basically uh, about 35 federal agencies who um, get together uh, on a quarterly or actually monthly basis for webinars that highlight interesting um, collaborations and projects going on um, in telehealth across multiple federal agencies. So Anthony and I were able to share this presentation with them. Um, and I think it's always so fascinating because of the, the number of um, collaborations and the technology and the, the outreach to education and healthcare um, in, in this really, maybe still one of the most rural frontier communities, definitely in Utah, but probably in the Western United States. So uh, let me introduce Anthony. He's the Network Administrator and Special Projects Manager for uh, the Information Technology Department at Utah Navajo Health Systems, which is a private nonprofit providing primary health care in San Juan County, Utah. Prior to joining uh, UNHS, Anthony worked for a consulting and engineering firm designing complex microwave radio and fiber networks that were part of a large intelligent transportation systems all over the United States. Anthony has a, a ton of experience and we're, we're really happy to have him present today. So Anthony, we'll turn it over to you. for the silence here for just a second. Uh, I took this picture while I was flying over a place called Comb Ridge, located in southeastern Utah. It, it's 80 miles long with near vertical walls um, on there. It's not easy to cross. It, if you have to, um, it takes a great deal of effort to build anything across of it. Um, I can only Im imagine what early travelers must have felt like when they're sitting on top of there trying to figure out how to either climb down or get uh, uh, wagons across there. In many respects, that's what it feels like to, to get, to get uh, bandwidth onto the Utah Strip of the Navajo Nation. It's what, uh, it's what I call the digital divide. It's where fiber optic cables and fiber networks end. It's the boundary between the, those who have fiber, uh, have access to fiber-based networks and those um, who do not. Uh, for me, the digital device divide is not a concept. It's a specific place on a map. It's the gap between our medical clinics and, and the solid green and where those um, solid green lines ends. That happens to be in Blanding, Utah. Uh, and before I go any further, uh, I wanted to point out that we've already come a long ways. Um, 
we're a member of the Utah Education and Telehealth Network, been working with Matt and others uh, in his team for many years. Um, as, you can see, as you can see from the map, UETN has, has done a great job of getting um, bandwidth uh, into southeastern Utah with help from commercial service providers. Um, in my mind, they've done all the heavy lifting. Um, we just simply wouldn't have been, been able to do it without their help, to be quite honest. If you zoom into the bottom right-hand corner of the map, um, this is the area that I'm talking about. This is San Juan County, Utah. Uh, we thought our goals were pretty straightforward. We needed, to, we needed to get a one gigabit fiber connection to each of our facilities. In this map, we simply wanted to extend the green line out to each of our clinics. The shaded areas at the bottom is what we call the Utah Strip of the Navajo Nation. As we looked into our options, we quick, quickly realized that things didn't look good. Uh, you don't have to be an expert to see a problem in this table. Uh, you need to see a green check mark in every column. If you're lucky, you might have more than one choice. Uh, while some of the areas have several options, we didn't have any options available at others. I'm not going to address why uh, at this particular point in time, but Monticello and Blanding are on private lands and the three locations on the right are on tribal lands. And while I don't want to get uh, too far ahead of myself, if you ever question or dismiss the, the power or influence of the regulatory environment, this is a perfect example of what can go wrong. I, uh, it would be really easy for someone uh, either here in person or listening in remote to, be, uh, to be, uh, get upset with my comments. My comments are not intended to beat up on any particular entity, agency, or tribal nation. There were, there were challenges everywhere that we turn. The, the technical challenges, Currently, besides my iPad. The technical challenges and financial challenges were not the hardest part of the project. It's the regulatory environment. I have uh, more comments about that uh, a little bit later. Um, now, I wanted to mention that our goal was to get one gigabit fiber-based services. So why am I gonna talk about microwave radios? Over time, we wanted to establish a backup circuit. When you use, uh, we use a cloud-based electronic medical record system. Like others, we also use cloud-based productivity applications, things like emails, file, file sharing, and payroll. On the clinical side, we, we simply can't keep the doors open without connectivity. Everything eventually breaks and you need to have a backup. You, you might have heard the term of backhoe fade, uh, especially those in the IT world. Um, it's when a backhoe digs up the fiber, fiber optic cable connecting your building. Our plan was to upgrade and expand our microwave network. Short term, it would provide the additional bandwidth that we needed. And long term, it would provide the backup path to keep things going when the backhoe gets a little bit uh, too close. Um, before I go any further, I wanted to take a minute to just introduce myself. Um, so that you understand my point of view. I spent the last 30 years or my entire adult life uh, doing uh, information technology related uh, field. But more important has been my specific focus on telecommunication systems design, construction, and operation. I'm originally uh, born in Monticello, Utah, which is a small town in, uh, in Southern Utah. And it's what I thought was a small town. Um, I've spent the last 10 years working for the Utah Navajo Health System. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about UNHS, uh, what we did, and some of the lessons that we learned along the way. Uh, I also want to tell you a little bit about uh, UNHS. We are a private, nonprofit Utah corporation. Um, when I bring up the name, it, it, uh, the Utah Navajo Health System, it can be a point of confusion uh, to some. So I wanted to make sure it was clear who we are and who we are not. We are not part of the state of Utah, but we are legally a Utah corporation. We are not part of the Navajo Nation, but we are recognized as a tribal entity. We're also not part of IHS or Indian Health Services, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, UNHS um, started out in the year 2000 with a single location in Montezuma Creek. The small clinic has grown over time and has since been replaced with this two-story building shown at the top of this slide. Uh, we have facilities in Monticello, Blanding, Montezuma Creek, Monument Valley, and, and Navajo Mountain. Um, I've actually been a, a part of UNHS since before it was UNHS. Um, the Montezuma Creek Clinic started out under 
the San Juan Healthcare Services, which is a special service district in San Juan County. The picture is from a local newspaper called the San Juan Record, and it shows Donna Singer, who was our first CEO, um, and a much uh, younger and, and, and thinner version of me. Um, we have a 100% Navajo Board of Directors re that represent the geographic areas that, that we serve. Um, all of our facilities are located in San Juan County, Utah, um, but uh, our close proximity to the Four Corners area means that we actually draw patients from Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. Um, um, as a federally qualified uh, community health center, we're, um, we're required to provide primary health care, including medical, dental, and behavioral health services. We also provide some uh, services that are unique, especially for a smaller organization of about 500 employees. We have a, a large non-emergency patient transport department. That was actually a surprise to me. Uh, we also provide EMS uh, in Montezuma Creek and Monument Valley. Um, bringing specialty care to remote areas is always a challenge. Um, we have specialists from the University of Utah that fly down on a regular basis um, to meet with our patients. That, this includes cardiology and others. Um, our Navajo Mountain Clinic is located at the base of an 11,000 foot mountain in order to get our medical staff and others to the site. We usually charter a small uh, Cessna 211 shown in the picture. And in case, uh, in case you're wondering, yes, it's a dirt road. Uh, yes, that's where we land, and uh, and yes, sometimes we have to wait for cars and horses to clear out of the way before we can land. Uh, it's a six-passenger plane, uh, similar to a Cessna 206, which is more common, but the 211 has retractable landing gear and a high-speed wing. The pilot likes to talk about the plane on the way out there. Um, the, the plane typically goes out to Navajo Mountain on Thursday, and besides the pilot, we usually send a behavioral health counselor a clinical pharmacist and a podiatrist. Sometimes they, they mix that up a little bit. I'm the one that actually took the picture in this case, and they always try and send someone out, uh, out to the site from the IT department at least uh, once per month. Um, this is one of our ambulances at our Montezuma Creek Clinic, and I'd like to point out that it's four-wheel drive. Uh, if you live in a typical urban area and you dial 911, you give them your name, your address, and the nature of the emergency. Um, but what do you do when you live here? There, there are no paved roads. There are no street signs. Why four-wheel drive? And I always tell people because it rains. Um, we often have to go out and pick up people where, where you have to drive across a dry wash or you have to drive uh, in some very soft uh, sand. It actually reminds me more of a search and rescue operation than, um, than just an ambulance call. Um, Enough about UNHS and I wanna get back to our project. Uh, one thing that I feel that is very important is to make sure that you begin with the end in mind. In the end, our goal is to have fiber-based communications to all of our facilities. It provides the high bandwidth and low latency that is critical for telehealth and many other services. Um, if, fiber, if fiber optic cable um, is my, my long-term goal. Why am I going to uh, include microwave radio? We live in a beautiful area, but it's also a very rugged terrain. I grew up in rural Utah, but I wouldn't describe this area as rural. I would describe uh, much of it as frontier. Uh, again, why microwave radio? It's simple. I can cover great distances in one shot and I don't have to get permission from the landowner uh, for the areas in the middle. This is really, really easy to overlook, but it's extremely important, especially when the regulatory environment is a challenge. Getting all the permissions was a huge challenge and is still a, a problem even today. Um, I always assumed that ownership of on tribal lands, and this again, this is just what I thought. I'm not got to be careful about that. I always assumed that ownership of tribal lands was pretty straightforward. I just assumed the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, worked. Uh, worked in what I would describe as a trust relationship with the Navajo Nation. I just assumed that the Navajo Nation was listed as what I would describe as the legal owner of the lands. It was the first time I'd ever heard of things like an individual allotment. That's where an individual tribal member is listed as the legal owner of the land and not the tribe. Um, I, I, I'm not going to suggest that I understand all of the, the details of it, but it's safe to say it's really complicated. Again, I go back to the question, if our goal is fiber, isn't microwave just a waste of money? No, our goal all along was to establish redundancy uh, or to have that backup path that we talked about earlier. Um, 
long term, the microwave uh, supports that purpose. And in the short term, it boosts our, our wide area network from a, a relatively small 150 megabits to 850 megabits. That's short of our goal of a full gigabit, of which is typically 940 megabits but it gets us most of the way there. Long-term, our, um, our radio tower sites are also used as a two-way radio repeaters for our microwave network. Um, we had a plan and we've been working the plan for many years. We realized that it would take a lot of time, um, a lot of effort and millions of dollars to put in place. But because of the cost, we knew it was gonna take years to build. We're patient but, and we knew we would eventually get there. Um, and I think like uh, everybody in this room can relate to then, then COVID-19 happened. And then for us, that changed everything. Our use of telehealth exploded uh, for our patients that lived off of the Navajo Nation. Um, our need for additional network capacity went up uh, just as we had switched over to cloud-based EMR and other services. Um, we had to try and take what I would consider our, our long-term plan and try and compress it down to one year, or at least that was our goal. Um, we also realized that there was a fatal flaw in the system and not so much with our plans, but actually a lot bigger. Our plan was how to improve our wide area network, our WAM. How, um, how do you address the bigger picture? How do you connect to your patients in the age of telehealth when they don't have access to telecommunications at home? Um, I'm a big movie fan and I couldn't help but to, to think of, of this poster. Um, um, San Juan County had the highest infection rates in the entire state. Um, the Navajo Nation um, had infection rates that, that appeared to be higher than, than many other areas. I, I took a lot of clips along the way here. In this, in this article, CNN is reporting that Navajo Nation has the highest per capita infection rates in, in the U.S. Um, eventually, life, life had to move on. We had to, adopt, uh, we had to adapt to, to what many of you would call the new normal. We had to find a way to move forward. Uh, we had to find a way to make it work. I think the tech companies were among the, uh, the first to send, company, uh, to send employees home, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, just to name a few. Uh, all of a sudden, everything was moving online. Uh, they decided to send students and teachers home. My wife's a, f a first grade uh, teacher, so I got to see this firsthand. And that works great when you live here. This is South Jordan, which is just a short drive uh, from where we are now, um, it's a residential area right outside of Salt Lake City. This subdivision has 50,000 plus homes. All of them have, uh, have gigabit fiber to 100% of the homes. Uh, it's not, a 50, not what carriers look for, which is at least a 50% take rate. That's 100% of the homes. If you, need, if you need to work from home and you're working here, that is not a problem. Um, the question is, what happens if you live here? This is a small community called Douglas Mesa, and it's located about 10 miles um, north of an area called Monument Valley. Uh, I'll assume that, uh, I know we have a lot of out-of-state visitors and you probably won't, may not know where Monument Valley is located, um, but it's, uh, it's something that you might recognize from some of the popular movies out there. Uh, uh, Forrest Gump with Tom Hanks, uh, Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox. Again, going back to that same picture, Douglas Mesa is just a few miles north of Forest Gump Hill. Um, the San Juan School District was trying to figure out a, a way to connect 1,400 students that were essentially taking classes at home, but without telecommunications to, to get them there. It's hard to do with no internet is essentially the bottom line. These students and these families are also our patients, and we realized something. It says if you figure out how to connect the student, you also connect the entire family. UNHS provided over 100 Chromebooks to the school district and let, and let them use our radio towers. Now we get, the ban now we get a, ban uh, a telehealth capable device in the home um, and a network connection to support it. It's win-win for everybody. The student gets the device, they get online. Uh, we can use the device for telehealth visits for any of the family members that are in the home. And the school district um, takes on the added burden of managing the device since they are already doing that anyway. Uh, back to our plan. We already had uh, fiber from the University of Utah right here in Salt Lake City to Blanding. It's just over 300 miles um, that's, that was already in the ground. Uh, this article uh, shown uh, from the, the Salt Lake Tribune was released about three years ago. It's dated November the 15th of 2019. 
uh, which denounced the project uh, to continue the fiber south from Blanding. They completed the first phase of the project uh, from Blanding to Montezuma Creek. That connected uh, two, two schools and our clinic. They were also able to connect an elementary school in Bluff. They have completed the first 43 miles of that cable. Um, I wanted to pause here for just a minute. Um, if I did my math right, that's a total of 202 miles of trench. Uh, they would normally use a ripper hook to break the rock loose in order to minimize the environmental impact. Um, um, they had to, they have to follow existing highways. Um, if they stay within the right of way, the clearances are easier to get because they, they already are in a dis what's considered a, a disturbed area because of the highway construction. Again, this is not easy. You can see the type of equipment that's involved with it. Uh, the ripper hook uh, clears a path for the plow. In this case, you can see the orange and blue conduit uh, going into the ground. Again, 404 miles of conduit. Uh, in some places, they have, uh, they'll have to drill holes and install new utility poles where they can't um, dig for whatever reason. For example, if they're crossing a river or a wash, it takes a lot of time, effort, and a lot of heavy equipment. Um, the contractor has made pretty good progress. Um, they're, they're in the process of getting from Bluff to Mexican Hat, and uh, I hope they'll get to Monument Valley, the area of uh, Forest Gump Hill that I showed just a few minutes ago. That's another 22 miles. Um, I'm, I'm not as confident, I say that uh, because of the regulatory side of things, but I'm not so confident they'll make it to, Monu uh, to Navajo Mountain. Um, that's another 109 miles to go. Uh, in the end, um, we have to uh, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Um, here's our interim plan. We've already talked a little bit about it. Uh, had plans to upgrade and expand our microwave network. Short, short term, it gives us that bandwidth and it also provides that backup path. That includes um, the installation of things like radio tower structures, um, like this, that's a 10 foot diameter antenna in the bottom right hand corner that you see there. Um, many people are surprised that we decided to go green. Um, our sites are 100% solar, solar powered. Um, we installed two large solar arrays at each site. You can see from a person that uh, circled down in the bottom left hand corner, uh, to give you a sense of size, each of the arrays are 51 feet wide and 14 feet tall. They're capable of providing 24,000 watts of power. Uh, it's enough to power the radios, the, ra the routers, the switches, and the air conditioning system that's at, at the site. People often wonder why we installed such large solar arrays. Uh, um, you have to design the solar system to keep the system operating even when it's not a bright sunny day. We really only need about two to four hours of sun to make it throughout the day. Uh, electricity from, from the panels are stored in an 80 kilowatt um, hour bank of lithium iron phosphate batteries. This is one of the safest forms of lithium batteries. Uh, and with the larger size, we can typically operate from two to four days uh, on battery alone. Um, that means we rarely, if ever, have to run the generator. Uh, UNHS was able to secure a 30-year lease for one acre of land from the DLM at a place called Cedar Mesa. That's the site that you're seeing on your screen now. Uh, it's important to note that our lease was in place and the site was built prior to being designated as a national monument. We had to clear the area around the tower uh, to create a fire break. Um, the site was pretty easy to get to um, because it's only four, about four, 400 feet total off the road. You'll be able to see the road coming up in the video there in a second. Um, the project included some very difficult construction. The Clay Hill site is at the end of a very rough five mile road. It'd be impossible to get a cement truck uh, up to the road to deliver the 60 cubic yards of concrete that was required to build the radio tower foundation, the building foundation, and the uh, supports for the solar arrays. And the foundation, um, um, this is a twin, uh, twin rotor aircraft. It's capable of lifting 6,000 pounds, but that includes all the rigging, the support cables, and the cement truck. Concrete is about 4,050 pounds per cubic yard. While it has a one and a half yard bucket, uh, it, we could only fill it to about one cubic yard. That means we had to take 60 trips to the site by helicopter. Uh, we had to deliver other materials to the site using uh, an army six by six truck. It takes a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, steel, cement, um, and effort as you can see uh, from this video.
sorry about the vertical video here. Um, we used a smartphone and, and forgot to check the orientation of the video. We also had to use a, a helicopter to stack the radio tower sections. Ro again, the road is not only too rough for a cement truck, but it's also too rough for uh, a crane to try and get it to the site. Um, with phase one complete and phase two scheduled to be complete uh, in the spring, we're just simply waiting for radios that have a really, really long lead time. Um, we're, gonna, we're ready to move on to what we described as phase, th phase three, which is uh, expansion out to the, the local chapters along the Utah Strip of the Navajo Nation. These links um, are shown in magenta on the screen there. Hopefully you can, you can see those up on there. Um, phase four is so the last part of our project is the installation of radio towers uh, at Navajo, what we call Navajo Mountain North Ridge. This is perhaps one of the most important parts of the project. As I mentioned earlier, UNHS operates EMS in Montezuma Creek and Monument Valley, and we need better two-way radio coverage in the southwest corner of the county. This part of our project is on hold because we still don't have the final permissions needed uh, from the Navajo Nation Land Department. That brings me to the biggest challenge of our project, and that's the regulatory environment. Um, for the last 30 years, most of the agencies in Utah that needed communications onto the Utah Strip of the Navajo Nation use the three radio sites that are circled on the map. I always ask why. It, it took me a while to figure it out, but it says these sites are the sites that are managed by the BLM or the Bureau of Land Management. It's part of the US Department of Interior. And believe it or not, it was significantly easier to navigate our way through the BLM process. Trust me, it was not easy, but it was much easier and quicker and a well, more well-defined process by, by comparison. This is probably gonna be an unusual slide. Um, you might think it's strange for me to bring up uh, low earth orbit satellites uh, when I'm talking a little bit about the regulatory environment. I've seen many of our patients start uh, to use this type of service. It's only been available for the last uh, 18 months or so. And it started with very, very limited availability and coverage. Um, I think a lot of people would assume that the primary benefit of uh, low earth orbit satellite service is that it doesn't require the cost of installing fiber optic cable. I would argue that for many that the biggest benefit is that it doesn't require the internet service provider to get bogged down with the complexity of dealing with the landowner in the middle in order to, to deliver the service. Um, I have two quick examples um, that demonstrate the power of the regulatory environment. Uh, one is on tribal lands and, and one is not. If you travel about 120 miles west of Salt Lake City, there are two small communities that most people uh, collectively put together into a place called Wendover. Um, it's actually two different towns, Wendover, Utah, and West Wendover, Nevada. Um, why are they different? You can pick the metric to compare. Um, you can look at the population. This is a really old slide, so it, um, it, the, these, these values may not be accurate for today's values, but it does give you a, a, a good example of the sharp differences between the Wendover, Utah and West Wendover, Nevada. Um, this article here from the Daily Herald, I think describes it best. West Wendover has always been better off thanks to the casino-based economy. Just to be clear, I am not here uh, to promote uh, the benefits of gambling. I'm simply bringing it up to show the difference that the regulatory environment makes. In the end, it all depends on which side of the Utah, uh, Utah Nevada line you are on. Uh, this is a, a satellite image of a small community in southeastern Utah called Mexican Hat. Um, what do you notice in the image? Um, where are all the businesses? Um, they are all on the north side of the river. The north side of the river is on private lands, the south side is on tribal lands. Again, I would argue that the primary difference is the regulatory environment. Um, I'm gonna leave this, this up here, but I've got, uh, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on here. And, it, and my final thought is about change. Um, if you live on tribal lands or if you provide services to, um, to those that live on tribal lands, ask yourself if you're happy with the telecommunications options that you have today. If you are, there's no reason to make a change. I guess the other way to say it is if you don't like the way things are and if you don't like the way things are headed, you need to find a way to move things in the right direction. You need to find a way 
need to find a way to, um, to move things in the right direction. You need to find the root cause of the problems and make the changes for the better. Many of our patients live on the Utah Strip of the Navajo Nation. Like others that live on tribal lands, they need access to the, the, the services that are really only available by fiber optics. Um, don't get caught up in the idea that 4G LTE or 5G is the solution for most homes. These are great technologies. I would probably argue that, that virtually everybody in this room, like me, use a mobile phone every single day. It's an important part of the solution, but it's just that, it's just a part. The good news is that the cost of fiber optics cable is not the problem. I think that's probably gonna be a surprise to many. At least it's not in Utah. Um, what I'm suggesting with that is there are existing programs that will allow service providers to provide services in the, these rural areas. And essentially is, it, it doesn't cost millions and millions of dollars to do that you would necessarily have to come up with if you were, if you were a tribe looking into this. Again, the good news is that cost is not, is not the problem, at least not in Utah. Um, please, I ask you if, you, uh, if you have an opportunity, work with local tribal leaders to make sure that they understand that the, reg the regulatory changes that are needed to get better service onto the communities where you live and work. Don't be afraid, oops. Don't be afraid to work with local service providers. Um, I, I always like to give one example. Um, if you live in South, if you live in San Juan County and you live off the reservation, you can order a one gigabit service, again, 900, 900 megabits um, for less than $80 a month. But that's only available to those that live off of the Navajo Nation. There, there are many things that I probably would, would like to, to, to tell you. Matt's reminding me that I'm just about out of time. I have about five minutes left. Um, I don't know if any of you have any questions. If you do, I'd be happy to field a few of those. Uh, again, with our limited time, if, if not, I'd be happy to talk to you, anybody individually afterwards um, during, the, during the lunch break or maybe between some of the afternoon sessions. Uh, looks like we have a question over here. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Jim Bush and I'm from Wyoming and where we deal a lot with the Wind River Reservation with the uh, Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone. Uh, as you were talking, I, I wrote a little note, say, you know, when you're talking about uh, fiber optic and the others, I wrote Starlink. And so you just had the one slide, but to me it seemed, and we are, have lots of people in the uh, frontier areas of Wyoming that have, are now using Starlink as a way to, you know, get re reliable access and gets you around a lot of the geographic and regulatory barriers. And you sort of touched on it, but I don't know, I didn't quite get your vision for, is that going to be a part of your future going forward? And my second comment was, uh, and, and again, our Arapaho and Shoshone tribe uh, population were the ones most impacted by COVID and uh, Wyoming, we we tracked that data and it was off the charts compared to e even any other. Uh, and we think that has a lot to do with how close the family units are, et cetera. But I've been working very hard trying to promote more telehealth. And there are some things, but uh, as you sort of alluded to, there are political and regulatory barriers. Do the tribes like your Navajo tribe in Utah, do you all have any sort of thing to get together to share best practices? Because I've been trying for over a decade to try to really increase the use of telehealth on our reservation and, you know, without being aggressive. But I, is that something you all would share with other tribes? Um, sure. Um, I, I've seen a lot of efforts like the governor's office of economic development, stuff like that, that, that uh, promote, I guess what I would call collaboration between agencies that are down there. Um, that usually includes all uh, some of the some of the tribal leaders. It'll it'll include representatives from some of the the local service providers, the telecom companies that are that are in the area, um, as well as uh, local what uh, economic people that do economic uh, development within either the city or the county as well. So usually, if you can find someone like that to kind of help. 
facilitate those kinds of meetings. Usually, we've actually been surprised at the number of people that actually show up. The biggest challenge that they have is there's a lot of support for it, but people are not really sure what the next step is. I always tell, I use the example it began with the end in mind. You really need to have a very clear picture in your mind because if you if it's if it's vague, people. If you if you've ever had uh, I would describe it like as a supervisory if you're a supervisor if you ever give an employee a task to do if the task isn't very clear they'll they'll flounder with it they won't they won't engage they won't start to go forward on the other hand if they know exactly what they need to do even if it's hard they'll they'll progress with it so. Uh, what I find is just making sure that they understand exactly what they need to do. Um, I'll, gi I'll give you an example. One of the challenges that we have in, in the area are things that sound really mundane, things like pole attachment fees. The local, uh, the, the local, I'm going to call it the local utility company in the area, their rates are four times the normal rate down there. So if, if someone in the regulatory side isn't involved to where they can help and engage with that utility company to get those down to a more reasonable level. Nobody will do it. Um, again, if you're if people are happy with the choices that they the, that are in front of them now, there's no reason for change. But I would argue that virtually, I would uh, at least my experience. I, I need to qualify that. My experience is that virtually nobody is happy with their options. Good example. The fiber optic cable is being buried along uh, US Highway 163. They're going right by a, a, a local uh, RV park. The, the, the people cut travel from all over the world to visit a play, that place called Monument Valley. They're within 300 feet of that fiber optic cable. They can't get approval from the regulatory authority to serve that, that facility. They're 300 feet away from there. Tell me that there's not something wrong with that. I would argue it's the regulatory environment. And your thoughts about Starlink and its role with your future? Um, we, we use it both as a company. Um, we have employees that work from home. Uh, in, in the IT world, you know, we, can have, we have people that answer the routine stuff, help desk calls, stuff like that from, uh, from home. Um, we also have a lot of our patients that are using it. Um, um, there are things that I'm not able to disclose right, related to Starlink and some of the, what. Uh, what I'll describe is uh, some. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe I better not go there. But we've we've had we've had some 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 donations in the area that have really been a, an improvement for people at home, because um, every everybody knows this, but especially during COVID, you've had to have the students, and oftentimes we're in Utah. Uh, I don't know what the average is, but I'm just going to pick the number around two, two kids per family. So you get, uh, you get two kids trying to do video conferencing and the parent the, and one of at least one of the two parents that are trying to do video from home, things like Starlink uh, make that possible. But, but I would always argue that remember I view Starlink as a, as, as a way of filling in, filling in the gap at the end of the day, begin with the end in mind, fiber optics cables, the only thing that was going to provide the type of services that I think will serve those those groups of actually, I was going to say those groups of people well. Anthony, thank you so much for sharing your insight with yeah. us. Um, that's, that's wonderful as always.